Hey, quit smoking the devil's lettuce. Why? Because you're too damn high. Housing. It's one of those things you start to think about once your parents politely hint that you're a video game loving, cereal munching parasite. So you go onto Craigslist or Zillow and you realize, hey, housing is priced very reasonably. In why Arizona? I mean, how the hell are you gonna afford the rents where you want to work, go to school, or be close to friends and family? Oh, you want to own a home, you say? Well, only if you're willing to live among the cactus. I live in San Francisco, and I'd hate to brag, but we're a little bit famous for our full-blown crisis of housing affordability. Chances are, though, wherever you are, either in the US or the rest of the world, you're starting to feel it too. Now in the midst of war, climate change, global inflation, why give a about how we mush together pieces of wood and rock? In asking myself this same question, I realized that housing is actually connected to, well, all of those things. Housing is something that every human soul needs, and it costs money. Half or more of your income today if you're poor. Housing determines the way we share space, orient ourselves to others in a society. It determines your economic life chances, your health, and even whether or not this little oblate spheroid is ever going to be livable anymore. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Why is the rent too damn high? Well, I'll tell you this. It won't be solved within Twitter's character limit. I mean, X. I don't care. Depending on your preferred political emoji, you may have heard takes ranging from housing is a human right. Helene value takes. We'll fix that. You want to know who's really solved housing? North Korea. In other words, not only do we have a crisis of affordability, we're in a parallel crisis of ideology. People disagree on the politics, the ethics, the facts. Who should you believe? More importantly, who should you blame? Developers? Landlords? Not in my backyarders, aka NIMBYs. But here's an attempt to bring clarity to this debate over the span of three videos. In this video, I'd like to shine a light on one part of the housing debate by focusing on the G word G -g 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 gentrification. I didn't have a better joke. There's a fierce battle over gentrification in Boyle Heights. Driven out by increasing property values and it's rent prices. It's one of the areas of Portland that has been gentrified. And really, you can't have a debate on housing without it. Well, what is gentrification? The conventional definition is when rich yuppies move into poor neighborhoods. Large city-based industries who set up shop also need to find neighborhoods to dump all these new $9 latte guzzling employees, raising land values, rents, and displacing others in the process. Big real estate loves this, buying low and selling high on property or charging enormous rents. Original inhabitants and cultures get displaced, and the entire place now looks sterile and smells like one giant man bun. Think of places like Brooklyn, my hometown of San Francisco, or London. As of late, I've gotten obsessed with gentrification. <laughs> on one hand, it sparks a healthy conversation on how capitalism exacts a toll on the poor and the marginalized. At the same time, and as I'll argue here, the gentrification conversation has mm, annoyed me. In this video, I'll explain how gentrification is not the main reason your rents are too damn high. In fact, it has oversimplified the conversation on economic inequality and race and has obfuscated our path to housing justice. I'll highlight deeper moral conundrums that have been overlooked by most people in the discourse and show what the debate reveals about ourselves. This video contains difficult discussions about identity, inequality, prejudice, and racism, which I'll present as tactfully as possible, and will refer to homelessness, according to this article, 
from the nonprofit organization Invisible People. What really is gentrification? Hoboken, New Jersey. Between 1978 and 1983, nearly 500 fires ripped through tenements and rooming houses, killing 55 people and leaving more than 8,000 homeless. Almost all of the displaced residents were Puerto Rican. Nearly every fire, investigators determined, had been attributed to arson by the property owners. Thereafter, an influx of white middle-class professionals flooded in, including those who wanted to be in closer proximity to Wall Street, in an era that was publicized as the Hoboken Renaissance. The original, largely working class, Puerto Rican residents would never return. Gentrification has one of those hard to pin down definitions, but very generally, it describes large demographic shifts, usually imposed upon lower income communities by wealthier, and often whiter, newcomers and business interests. Hoboken in the 1980s was probably the most extreme form of gentrification, but has certainly evolved over time because arson, at least in modern times, is harder to get away with as an investment strategy. Today, displacement of original residents happens by other more subtle economic and social forces. But let's rewind a bit more in US history. Here in the U.S., a majority of our cities still reflect old boundaries created back when America was like eh, racial segregation, oh, mm, oh, reasonable, oh. Redlining, the deliberate practice of blocking home financing to black people, allowed white households to segregate themselves into wealthier, more homogenous communities. This basically gave America's segregation experiment more inertia to last far longer beyond the point that segregation was officially ruled unconstitutional in 1968. Look at it this way. Out of all the loans the Federal Housing Administration insured from 1934 to 1962, guess what portion went to white Americans? No higher. A little higher. 98% this was only decades ago, mind you. Today, the racially restrictive covenants that whites use to keep others out still remain in writing today. And take a look at this ad from the era. Two gifts for each child free. A big box of fine candy. A real sure enough Christmas present. Ho ho, all any child has to do is take a grown up friend with him or her and register at the tract office. Lots and presents restricted to the Caucasian race. Ho ho ho. Keep the North Pole one. And let's not forget, this is capitalism, baby. State-sponsored edition. The rich areas get richer, the poor areas get poorer. Formerly redlined areas are now economically depressed, receive inferior public services such as bad schools and experience higher crime. But all the disinterest and divestment in those neighborhoods last only for so long because later, especially when demand for housing spikes, they turn into prime real estate and the cycle of gentrification begins. The real estate industry has been classically known to accelerate gentrification through development, like new housing, a Whole Foods, a CrossFit gym, all of which can drive up the cost of living, rents, taxes, local prices, etc., beyond the capacities of existing residents, often working class folk. You can buy low and divested neighborhoods, often in close proximity to job centers, and reap rewards through property appreciation and rent increases. For those at the receiving end of gentrification, it's a very visceral experience to see realtor signs and cranes erected all over your neighborhood, being reminded every day that you, the existing inhabitants, stand to gain absolutely nothing from all this activity and noise. And in the age of better technology, ever-increasing financialization, and thus ever-increasing inequality, it's only natural that we lean on gentrification to name these feelings of unwelcome change and displacement. This paints a more recognizable portrait of gentrification, much more capitalistic in orientation. Urban scholar Neil Smith writes, the restructuring of urban space due to gentrification now taking place is likely to produce nothing short of a bourgeois playground. So, you could say gentrification is really just a problem of capitalism. Oh, there's your problem. 
We did it, folks! But, if you watch any of my videos by now, you won't be surprised to hear me say that I find that answer deeply unsatisfying. Why? Because there's actually much more to this problem than most people appreciate, which I will now spend the rest of this video trying to unpack. The word gentrification has an interesting history. The gentry referred to upper tier citizens in old England, often the wealthy land owning class portrayed in those satirically delightful Jane Austen novels. Oh, in Bridgerton. 1964 is when sociologist Ruth Glass coined the term gentrification as she began to notice and document the influx of young middle-class professionals moving into the working-class immigrant communities of London. The newcomers weren't wealthy capitalists, though. They were middle-class artists, writers, scholars like Glass herself, attracted to a more bohemian lifestyle of lively, crowded streets and cultural diversity. This new cultural capital increased the desirability for even more middle-class professionals to move in and eventually displace the existing residents through rising rents, among other economic pressures. Gentrification can thus be understood not just as an economic phenomenon, but also a cultural phenomenon of upper and middle-class whites all of a sudden ditching their quaint suburbs and shifting their cultural tastes back toward the cities but in the process, diluting or overtaking the culture that had already existed before they arrived. Ruth Glass died in 1980 and would not live to see the term she coined experience such a meteoric rise in interest. Google Books data shows the term gentrification taking off exponentially in the past few decades. Gentrification is being thrown around everywhere now. It's now a metaphor for anything that's appropriated or ruined by white or middle-class tastes. Graphic novels, well, they're comic books, but gentrified. Rock and roll, gentrified. Jesus. Ice cube. Snitches get stitches. Snitches, 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 what are you talking about? I'm going to change myself into an ice cube. <laughs> At this point, everyone now recognizes gentrification when they see it. Or do they? Ever see these new blocky buildings go up in your neighborhood? This has become known as the gentrification building aesthetic, which often creates these massive contrasts between old and new, as if it's displacement on full display. This is what gentrification looks like. But in truth, there's actually nothing particularly special about this architecture, as this TikToker shows. TikToker? TikToker? It's spelled toker. This building right here is renting for less than the average rent in this area. That means it's making the neighborhood more affordable, not less. Buildings are blocky because this is usually the most cost-effective way to build modern developments, including affordable units, a type of housing that actually reduces gentrification. This TikToker, toker, here inviting audiences to shun a new massive gentrification building in historically working class Camden, New Jersey. You know it when you see it. Gentrification building. Well, turned out to be affordable housing. I saw one one day that sort of hit me and it was a TikTok that was showing this building in Camden, New Jersey. And I find the building, I look at the address, I look into property records to figure out what this building was. And not only is it new housing, it's actually new affordable housing. This is not to say that these types of buildings might not have any effect on the community. But what I am saying is that gentrification, it's a very slippery concept. It's hard to capture data-wise. And if you want to fight it, you're basically facing a moving target. There is an entire academic field of gentrification scholarship, and even they struggle to define it with consistency. What demographic membership do you need? 
What does your income have to be? How long does one have to reside in an area to be a native resident to be considered displaced? When does gentrification begin? Does it start when the very first middle class white person moves into a non-white underinvested neighborhood? When does gentrification end? Does it ever end? And if it's tough to define, it's actually even tougher to measure it. You might think, well, all we got to do is count the number of forceful displacements from evictions or foreclosure, or rent hikes, property tax increases, uh, harassment from the landlord, etc. Certainly these numbers should be higher in gentrifying areas like San Francisco, Brooklyn. Well, interesting story, they're not. Multiple longitudinal studies at least, aka taking snapshots of lots of different households in different neighborhoods and seeing what happens to them over time actually don't show signs of greater forceful displacement between neighborhoods deemed gentrifying versus non-gentrifying neighborhoods. In other words, data evidencing gentrification has been kind of weak or mixed at best. Complicating things more is that gentrification is not only about forceful involuntary displacement, there are more voluntary responses to pressures, unjust as those pressures might be down with capitalism, like cash offers for your home. And you know, some people just straight up move, like for a myriad of reasons, to pay marginally cheaper rents, to pursue better opportunity, to unite with other social networks. Neighborhood demographics shift all the time, both in gentrifying and non-gentrifying areas. Not everyone wants to lay in a neighborhood like this forever until the sky falls down on them. Unless you're Savage Garden. This is not to deny that gentrification is happening. It certainly is. It is just not happening in the way that we think it does. And I certainly don't mean to imply that gentrification studies are a wasted effort mainly because it has led to much more troubling findings, not necessarily about gentrification, but on larger and more pernicious problems of increasing segregation by race and class. More on that later. Why don't y'all take a look at that sign up there? See what it says? Cash for your home? It's called gentrification. The 1991 film Boys in the Hood was set within the disadvantaged, segregated black communities of LA following a young, studious boy named Trey. Trey's father, Furious, no relation to Morpheus, works in service of the community, helping locals finance their own homes. Throughout the film, Furious plays the role of a moral sage, like Morpheus. And in one particular scene, he educates the audience about the roots of their own dystopia, like Morpheus. Listening? Yeah. They bring the property value down. They can buy the land at a lower price. Then they move all the people out, raise the property value, and sell it at a profit. Now what we need to do is we need to keep everything in our neighborhood, everything, black. Black owned with black money. This brings up our first theory around gentrification, that gentrification is caused by outside investment. And therefore, in order to prevent displacement, one needs to block outside investment and own the block. In her book, Reclaiming Your Community, environmentalist and entrepreneur Majora Carter chronicles her own role as a real estate developer trying to revitalize her home community of South Bronx, New York into something created and owned by local residents. The task, however, is not so easy as she runs into massive obstacles, among them clashing with anti-gentrification activists upset at her for introducing forces that have otherwise been known to gentrify communities. She too was trying to address gentrification, but through her role as a developer, encouraging new locally owned businesses such as new hip cafes that can bring more resources into the community. The term developer, however, doesn't sit very well. She was accused of selling out her neighborhood. Her efforts were rejected as real estate industry tactics simply rebranded, the same tactics that displaced community members and disrupted its social character. It got to the point where she was solidly vilified through protests and hit pieces. And this reveals some very uncomfortable questions that the gentrification discourse has not yet answered. How does one keep resources, quote, in the community? 
If Carter's development efforts succeeded, would that have still displaced at least some members of her community in the form of appreciating property values, rents, or anything else that might attract white middle class consumers? In fact, some scholars, like Nishani Fraser, sees the process of public investment, say building a new park or a transit station, creates more desirability and therefore an initiation of the gentrification process. Changing the park, changing the schools, sidewalk, signage, I can go down the line, new trees, all indicators that the city is pushing, right, a new change and transformation in a community. That's when you know gentrification is coming and not one person has showed up to buy a house yet. If public investments are off limits, then are there any forms of investment that are gentrification proof? I appreciate Carter's premises in her book. She recognizes a lot of research around economic mobility, which I'll get to later, that areas of highly concentrated poverty are so disadvantaged that it becomes wishful thinking to expect communities inside a contained vacuum to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps and become Cinderella's like Trey, who rise up and overcome disadvantages imposed on them. Carter wanted to fight what she saw as the biggest problem, brain drain. How are community resources going to be improved if your best and brightest, like Trey in the film, goes off to study, never to return? Gentrification doesn't start when you see middle-class white people, cute cafes, and doggy daycares in formerly poor communities of color, or even when predatory speculators smell the blood of an easy victim. It starts when people in low-status communities believe that there is no value there. There's an added issue. How can communities multiply its capital if there's no capital to work off of due to historic deprivation? Where are communities going to get that money? At some point, does there have to be some form of outside influence, resource, investment? I personally find this vision for communities to, quote, own the block appealing. But if you get down to the practicals, turns out it's really easier said than done. Doing so requires things that not everyone is going to agree with, especially if those efforts are seen as compromising community culture and identity. Trying to make the delectable Mexican chamoy sauce, sugar-free and diabetic-friendly? Not without gentrifying, you're not. Being told that we're gentrifying chamoy because we're making it sugar-free and with no artificial dyes is annoying. But we started this company because we got tired of seeing healthy and sugar-free options of all American candies, but never Mexican, so. Gentrification is controversial because it is often a proxy for racial or ethnic tensions. Groups marginalized by society are typically the first on the displacement chopping block, and thus gentrification to some is tantamount to cultural genocide. There is a shameful history of forceful displacement to work off of in the US. Hoboken was one example. Urban renewal programs were another brazen effort to clear, like actually bulldoze black neighborhoods and replace it with things that white people liked, like ultra-wide freeways so white people can save 10 minutes on their commute to the city from the suburbs. All of this was done in the name of clearing, quote, blight. A real win-win, right? We cleared your blight for you. You're welcome. So naturally today, any construction or neighborhood change sends chilling memories of that history. Now. Minority heritage in any society is constantly under threat of erasure, if not from bulldozing homes. In fact, it happens every day when education curriculums admit important histories of other groups, or when younger generations forego family traditions, like their parents' spoken languages. So it is only fair to try and resist that trend, especially when it comes to the sacredness of place. I saw an interesting tweet from an anti-gentrification activist one day stating, in an ideal society, there would still be cultural neighborhoods that provide exclusive, safe spaces for those cultures to be preserved and to grow, believing that these clusters would be better if integrated into whiteness slash heteronormativity is a settler mindset. Quite a provocative position, but it's actually a sentiment shared by quite a few people. And the suggestion is that the only moral thing to do is to try to set up defense perimeters around neighborhoods to preserve authentic character. <laughs> While self-determination by marginalized groups is very important, 
I also find this piece of the gentrification discourse to be um, counterproductive in this regard. Let me just pose one question here. Just what exactly are we trying to preserve in the first place? Journalist and culture writer Kalefe Sané wrote about this phenomenon, noticing how in today's culture, where the ghetto once seemed a menace, threatening to swallow the city like an encroaching desert, now it often appears in scholarly articles and the popular press as an endangered habitat. Even by academics, the ghetto either rightfully or wrongfully began to be romanticized. Sociologist Kenneth Clark in 1965 expressed skepticism of desegregation, saying that instead of integrating schools, better to demand excellence in ghetto schools. Malcolm X at one time called for complete segregation as the only way to solve racial strife. But if you think about it, how long can you preserve the ghetto and not preserve race and class-based segregation? I'm really drawn to this question. These very prescriptive ideas to preserve, quote, neighborhood character create a lot of conundrums about how we understand and respect racial autonomy in society. In the 1990s, hood films like Boys in the Hood broke out in popularity. John Singleton, the director of Boys in the Hood, was the first black director ever to win an Oscar. On one hand, this was signaling new visibility and appreciation for the black experience in the US. On the other hand, progress on representation seemed to have stopped there. Certainly, the story of black struggle, living in poor, disadvantaged, and volatile environments, is an important part of one's identity, but is it the only part? Decades would pass and people of color would be snubbed from roles outside of hood-like characters. It sent the message that authentic portrayal of black identity that the broader American public could understand could never be in other genres, teen dramas, adventure films, detective films, tortured heroes, fantasy. The early part of the golden age of TV with shows like 24, Breaking Bad, The Sopranos, Dexter, Chuck, revolved around more complex main characters defined by attributes other than their race. And it was tacitly understood that these roles could only be played by white men, if not to avoid breaking people's brains, I guess. Shows with black main characters were separated into their own black struggle genre, and the only main character roles with some actual nuance seemed to be only reserved for Will Smith for some reason. No representational ceilings would be broken until around the last decade. Majora Carter also took issue with this notion of authenticity. In her fight to advocate for more resources coming into the community, Carter maintained that both these anti-gentrification activists and wealthy whites observing the situation from afar had one thing in common. They were of the mindset that poverty defined community identity. In my experience, poverty is also linked with authenticity in low-status communities. Those who don't fit a profile of desperation, whether an aspiring local entrepreneur or a homeowner, are not considered representative of the community and thus not planned for in any meaningful way. This fans the flames of talent exodus and a concentration of poverty. To what extent is our notion of community realized by the communities themselves? Or are they understood through the prism of white-centric popular opinion. The Freakonomics podcast, which I don't know if there's anything more emblematic of whiteness, <laughs> had an episode in which hosts Dubner and Levitt examine a hypothetical of who they would like to staff for their pretend Chinese restaurant. How do you think you would uh, approach hiring the wait staff of this Chinese fast food airport restaurant, do you want them to match the food in some way? Absolutely. Why is that? When it comes to ethnic food, I'm not sure why, but we've decided that it tastes better when it's served by people of that ethnicity. We're certainly bothered when people misrepresent heritage, often for popularity or profit. On the other hand, 
What Levitt is also representing is the way white people reify culture, using a very narrow definition of authenticity that captures the essence of this tweet. And that is what the gentrification conversation is doing. It imposes rules on identity, prescribes what authenticity means, and it solidifies more our status quo understandings of race in society. For identity to emerge from beyond the margins, it requires at least some acceptance of dynamism and imagination beyond traditional tropes. Put it another way, segregation by race and class is not a prerequisite for cultural preservation. That was a lot. Let's put it in another way. What about the neighborhoods that aren't gentrifying? I mentioned before, thanks to redlining and exclusionary covenants, segregation still persists today as a result of historic policies and behaviors. And they're reinforced in subtle ways that give the appearance that everything you see in segregated poor communities are a result of their own agency. There is often another overlooked dimension to the gentrification story, and it takes place in the neighborhoods that aren't gentrifying. Writer Jerusalem Demsas, whose takes on housing I regurgitate probably a little too much, states, Our focus on gentrification might lead people to believe that it is the dominant form of inequality in American cities. But the core rot in American cities is not the gentrifying neighborhoods. It is exclusion, segregation, and concentrated poverty. White, wealthy neighborhoods that have refused class and racial integration have successfully avoided much scrutiny, as gentrification has taken center stage in urban political fights. Over here is um, Gentrif Park, with areas of highly concentrated poverty, but in close proximity to job centers. And over here is the suburb of uh, Horde, uh, heights, consisting of wealthy, largely white homeowners who don't have to think or worry at all about their own neighborhoods gentrifying. Oh, that certainly doesn't mean they aren't worried about something, though. What is that, you ask? Well, let's put it this way. While Gentrif Park fears gentrification, Horde Heights fears the people of Gentrif Park. Do the denizens of Horde Heights have any responsibility in the gentrification story? After all, aren't they the source of the yuppies trying to move into black and brown communities? Are we saying that by staying put in Horde Heights, that they're making the most ethical decision in the face of gentrification? What if the forces that make gentrification so bad, the undervaluation and divestment, was directly related to the overvaluation of wealthy white communities. And by keeping the attention on gentrifying neighborhoods, the gentrification conversation starts to look like a pretty convenient way for the wealthy white homeowners to resist integration. There is a term, not in my backyard, NIMBY for short. Come to me, flying NIMBYism. It describes a phenomenon of people being okay with necessary changes made to our cities the catch is, no one wants to see it close to where they live. And this is where U.S. rugged individualism goes awry. If everyone successfully resists adding any new housing close to where they live, then no one, including our most vulnerable, gets any housing. Case in point, venture capitalist Mark Andreessen once penned an essay championing the need to build more housing. We need to break from the rapidly escalating price curves for housing, education, and healthcare to make sure that every American can realize the dream. And the only way to do that is, is to build. To build. <laughs> Give it a few years, though, when the prospect of building affordable apartment units in his exclusive suburb of Atherton, California, average home price $8.2 million. He, along with his wife, Laura Ariaga, lecturer on Inclusivity. Let their nimby stripes show just a little. Dear Mayor Golia and the members of the Atherton Town Council, I'm writing this letter to communicate our immense <laughs> objection to the creation of multifamily overlay zones in Atherton. 
Please immediately remove all multifamily overlay zoning projects as they will massively decrease our home values and immensely increase the noise, pollution, and traffic. What does this thing do? If you can manage to sit on this cloud, it can fly you wherever you want. NIMBYism is a powerful force, usually invoked by wealthy homeowners and is often very successful in blocking much needed things for public benefit. Not only does it block housing, it also blocks vital public services like homeless shelters, environmentally friendly infrastructure, even public transit lines. The ability to shoot things down easily has narrow benefits, of course. NIMBYism has been responsible for protecting green spaces or blocking the construction of harmful things like new freeways, such as one that would have conceded the center of San Francisco to cars instead of people. But NIMBYism by far has been negative, especially on politics, turning collective problem solving into obstructionism. I support this project because it helps greatly ill Worst of all, NIMBYism has been a driving force to build and maintain segregation. Why shouldn't Redondo Beach and every city in California have to, by state law, build more housing? Well, we're already full. We're already full. We're, 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 we're already full. We're, 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 we're already full. We're, 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 we're already full. And then these flyers went out. You know, I don't want to throw my whole city under the bus. There's a majority of nice people. Was there a racial component to That's it? That's all. You think? 100%. Think? Here in America, we govern ourselves in a very special way in that we delegate housing decisions to a smaller level. Now, of course, if you are among the freedom-loving, big government-hating among us, this is a good thing because communities are free to self-determine, dictate their own fate. Paradoxically, this allows us to democratically decide to undemocratically exclude others from having a voice in your community. Zoning. More like groaning. You thought I was done with Atherton, California? Well, where do you think I got the inspiration for Horde Heights? In 2023, when there was a proposal to upzone a single family plot into a multifamily apartment development, it drew the displeasure of none other than three-point shooting, mouth guard chewing, FTX endorsing NBA star, Steph Curry. Writing, we hesitate to add to the not in my backyard, literally, rhetoric. We have major concerns in terms of both privacy and safety with the three-story townhomes looming directly behind us. So what exactly does this article mean by up zoning. Well, let me introduce you to a little thing called zoning. You can't just build anything you want, anywhere you want. Cities need to be organized, telling people through designated zones what can be built and where. Ever play SimCity? Ever wonder what the green and blue and yellow squares meant and the role they played? Playing as a kid, I never gave them second thought. But funny enough, I later realized that I was actually using the instruments that municipalities and city planners use to exclude people. When trying to build actual housing for your city, you can choose between two residential zoning types. Dark green for high density residential such as apartment buildings, or light green for low density residential such as single family homes and mansions. Applied in the real world, Light green usually means if you want to have a home, you can only put one household on one plot of land. Now this might seem pretty innocuous on its own, but the reality is single family zoning wreaks havoc on society in times of scarcity. Historically, single family zoning has been enforced in many localities, but most commonly in wealthier homeowning communities. It allows you to pick your neighbors by Guaranteeing your community is only populated by people of similar income. Give single-family homeowning communities a brush to paint their city, and no surprise, they will only paint things in their own image. And today, many cities, especially here in California, have the power to make it illegal to zone for anything other than light green squares. Oh, should we propose to upzone one of those squares to dark green? 
Yo, oh, well, I hope you're happy. You've just invited a wave of drugs, crime, homelessness. And that's why this has been aptly dubbed exclusionary zoning. By refusing to upzone and committing to never build new homes, you're basically deciding to never integrate your neighborhoods by class and by proxy, race. To those fighting tooth and nail, knowing full well this fact, I'm just gonna call you for what you are, a segregationist. It's not just the pristine homogeneous character that people are trying to protect. It is a way to block others from enjoying in the same good schools, local services, public parks, etc. This hoarding mentality got so bad in one community in San Jose, California, faced with the problem of their own teachers being priced out, that they decided to block teacher housing on grounds that it's just frankly not fitting with the rest of the community. And I can't underscore how important location is to economic opportunity and mobility. There's been a great deal of research done to figure out what are the conditions most conducive for people to thrive and succeed, to get educated and get admission to good schools and benefit from social capital. In fact, I'd recommend a really good video done on this from Street of Sweeper that goes over segregated geographies and the opportunity gap in the context of American school reform. It's really good. He's got a soothing voice. Or so he's told. Back to our region. Let's say you had resources in the form of funding or policy interventions to help the people of Gentriff Park. What, pray tell, would be the best approach for creating wealth, uplift, stability, and prosperity? Most people would say that resources should go straight to the community of Gentriff Park, supporting nonprofit efforts to areas that are most affected. These include funding better schools or after school programs, community centers, gardens, libraries. Assistance can also come in the form of public housing developments like the Hope 6 program in the 90s. All of these represent a concentrated focus on Gentriff Park or place strategies. And it's a microcosm of an academic debate on social mobility. There are a few problems with a place-based model, mind you. These efforts aren't usually enough to scale, to overcome challenges found in Gentriff Park's areas of highly concentrated poverty. And beyond a one-time injection of resources, these places need even more to sustain these interventions over time. Their tax base pales in comparison to Horde Heights, and arguably, they would need more than the equivalent amount of resources just to manage the types of challenges that Horde Heights gets to insulate themselves from. Crime, homelessness, worse healthcare outcomes, etc. Nonprofits can help, but they are far from perfect. And I speak from experience that you're often spending a lot of your time fundraising, courting donors, collecting impact metrics, rather than delivering quality services. Now don't get me started on the cycle of dependency on private funds from wealthy donors. There is one idea to fight gentrification that has gotten quite popularized called community land trusts, mostly nonprofit organizations that acquire and own land to house existing residents and prevent displacement. It's also designed to maintain community ownership away from the reach of private developers. All good and well, but proponents of community land trusts tend to forget that acquiring land costs a butt ton of money. Land trusts have been notoriously hard to scale and only account for a tiny fraction of our total housing supply. But when you look at the economic mobility research, you'll actually find that the solution is a bit counterintuitive. What if we didn't channel resources directly into Gentriff Park as a place? <gasps> I know, I know, I know. Instead, what happens when you invest in people over place? Support their ability to just pick up and move to wealthier communities. These are called mobility strategies. In theory, it's a fool's errand to try to rebuild underfunded institutions and failing services in areas of highly concentrated poverty, and just allow people the choice to live by institutions that are already healthy. A program in the 90s called Movement to Opportunity, or MTO, did just that. And you might be pleased, or disappointed, to know that this and programs like it yielded remarkable results in earnings, educational achievement, and quality of life improvement for its recipients. The data is there. This is not without controversy, however, in part because it's also very expensive and unscalable. 
But mainly, wouldn't this erase communities in the process? Let's be clear. What this line of research tells us is not that people need to pick up and leave. Instead, the takeaway should be that economic integration is much more important than we think. Not only should people be able to stay in place, should they choose, they should also not be blocked from moving to opportunity, should they also choose. Gentrification discourse assumes that community is only defined by place or proximity to others. But here's a provocation. What if we weren't so married to place in defining identity, culture, and community? What if it was not solely defined by streets, houses, and businesses? What if it were defined by people allowed to thrive in whatever setting they choose for themselves, gentrifying neighborhood or otherwise? Disadvantaged communities don't need to rely on wealthy people. They just need them to cough up their damn resources. More obvious solutions would be for more equitable distribution of tax funding, let's say through progressive taxation, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. There are a number of insidious ways to preserve inequality that are baked into the basic design of our cities. There's a lot more to say about this, including how places like Gentriff Park actually subsidize the lifestyle of Horde Heights. Would highly recommend a video by Not Just Bikes about this very subject. These gray sections are the poorer areas, while these red areas are significantly wealthier. The poorest people in Lafayette are consistently subsidizing wealthy suburbanites. The anti-gentrification discourse may not be wrong in substance, but it is wrong in focus. To fixate solely on ailing neighborhoods rather than broader systems of inequality and economic injustice is to put on the horse blinders. Knowing what we know about mobility, fighting gentrification as an antidote to inequality assumes that the poor operate in a vacuum, and that it's just a simple matter of leaving them alone to pick themselves up by their bootstraps. There are some people who miss this point altogether. You might be surprised how hard white, wealthy homeowners, and now increasingly Asian, the well-to-do in my community has responsibility in this too, to try to be champions for the victims of gentrification. You can't help but wonder, are these highly impassioned efforts out of genuine sympathy for the victims of displacement? Or is it selfishly convenient to co-opt their plight, using leftist talking points to defend the status quo and avoid disrupting their otherwise capitalist class sensibilities. It's a spectrum, but I'd like to briefly focus on the latter. Berkeley, California, situated on the scenic hillsides across the bay from San Francisco, a city of progressives and home to one of the most leftist institutions in the US, UC Berkeley. Well, guess what? When the citizens of Berkeley were faced with an influx of new freshmen, NIMBYs forced the number one public university in the country to cap their admissions. What was their reason? Well, despite being one of the most diverse college campuses in the country, the native residents of Berkeley went ahead with a frivolous environmental lawsuit arguing that the students would, quote, displace low-income families. Imagine working hard to gain admissions into Berkeley and then finding out a wealthy NIMBY activist, who, by the way, spends half of his time in New Zealand said, sorry, you can't come, otherwise you'll gentrify our city. By the way, according to Redfin, Berkeley's median home value is 1.4 million. You know, progressive. Rather prominent UC Berkeley professor Robert Reich, whom you might recognize from his bite-sized educational videos espousing left-wing economics, and whom I've had a great level of respect for, but to my disappointment, I found out that even he has the capacity to NIMBY freak out at the prospect of dense apartment units in his neighborhood. The point that I'm trying to make is that the gentrification discourse allows people to live action role play being a leftist without ever having to practice their values materially and concede space for others who actually need it. There's actually a term for this, facile liberals, a concept I picked up from Paulo Freire and Donaldo Macero, one of his colleagues, documenting their disdain for critical educators who often betray action required by praxis by fossilizing their purported political project into an obscure discursive criticality that begs to move beyond the always postponed arrival of action, that is, 
action designed to transform the current perniciousness of the neoliberal godification of the market into new democratic structures that lead to equity, equality, and authentic democratic practices. In other words, many facile liberals and so-called critical educators boast their leftist credentials by wearing their proclaimed Marxism on their sleeve, usually only expressed in written discourse or in the safety of the academy, a posture they believe to be even more radical. Facile liberals outside the academy come in NIMBY form, and as shown with the Berkeley example, they make an extremely potent political force. One San Francisco politician who brands himself left of left once helped block the city from using a vacant hotel space in his district for permanent supportive housing for the homeless in historic Japantown. Let's see, if I was pandering to NIMBY voters in my district, how would I put some tone-deaf leftist spin on the- Japantown has endured a painful history of racist state-imposed decisions that left a legacy of distrust. From internment to redevelopment, we need to recognize that making decisions for, instead of with, the J-Town community can reopen generational wounds. This cannot be ignored. As a fancy homeowner himself, living right on the city's iconic Alamo Square, you know, from Full House, he has been notorious for blocking housing projects, which is likely to curry favor with very politically active homeowning constituents. All the while, he and many like him on the surface fashion themselves as uncompromising leftists fighting for affordable housing. A city council member of Lafayette, California, a suburb of San Francisco, once tweeted a website called Our Neighborhood Voices, decrying gentrification from her exclusionary suburb, median home value 1.5 million, black population 0.7%. Problem isn't just politicians, though. There are also more institutional forces who try to conflate the interests of wealthy homeowners with those experiencing housing insecurity. Two election cycles ago, I received this mailer in my inbox. It was a picture of civil rights activist James Baldwin, with a quote from when he spoke out against urban renewal programs in San Francisco, where developers gutted black neighborhoods, such as the Fillmore District, once dubbed the Harlem of the West. Hang on, what's this for? It's advocating against a state bill trying to encourage more housing density near transit stations. Hmm, okay. This ad is sponsored by a group called the AIDS Healthcare Fa Uh, uh, what? Wait, this is about AIDS? For background, the AIDS Healthcare Foundation is a US nonprofit medical provider with $1.5 billion in annual revenue. They are also owners of substantial property, including housing blocks that have been recently investigated for what looks to be slumlord behavior. But most importantly, they are a very powerful player in California politics, pushing for measures to slow construction of new housing. Pictured here is their controversial CEO, Michael Weinstein. On the surface, it's hard to disagree with some of the messaging alone, but after a while, you wonder how grassroots this really is versus an industrial complex around progressive sounding causes. Does the phrase, housing is a human right, sound familiar? Go to housingisahumanright.org and you'll see, hey, AIDS Healthcare Foundation. They have been prominent supporters of rent control while outwardly showing solidarity with the working class. Until, and at the time of recording, they decided to break with tenants' rights groups on a statewide rent control bill and oppose the measure, siding with real estate. Oh, and remember that Our Neighborhood Voices website from the anti-gentrification suburbanite? What? They're everywhere! Let me clarify, my scrutiny of these facile liberals is not an attempt to say their sentiments are astroturf. Many of their views are shared by those who actually represent the housing insecure and have very justified anxieties over neighborhood change. But I hope what's clear by now is that my annoyance is primarily with those who exploit those anxieties to promote the segregationist impulses of the more privileged. These folks can invoke social justice tropes until they're blue in the face, but at the end of the day, history will remember this effort as politics by homeowners for homeowners. All right, all right, I gotta wrap this up. Uh, uh, okay. Let me see how I can make this more interesting for people who love theory. 
No, theory. You could see gentrifying neighborhoods as an arena for class conflict. The native working class residents are the proletariat, struggling to defend the right to remain in place against capitalist influence, both from the beneficiaries of capitalism, the yuppies, and more blatant members of the capitalist class, like developers and landlords. I too see the class conflict, but just a little differently. Zoom out a bit and ask, where do all the capitalist tech executives, real estate financiers, even the titans of the nonprofit sector go home to at night? Where does value, made possible by the labor of others, get hoarded by capitalist elites? Does it only reside in the boxy apartment buildings being erected in major population centers like New York or San Francisco? Or does it lie in the segregated towns, the rich suburban enclaves over which its denizens fight ruthlessly to refuse class and race-based integration? Why are they so vehemently opposed to sharing the benefits of where they live? If it wasn't worth that much, then what the hell are these folks trying so hard to protect? Doesn't the path forward lie in somehow seizing that value for the people who most deserve it? I don't want to belittle anyone deeply concerned about the issue of gentrification. We do have to accept two things about the gentrification discourse. One, that it's a genuine cry of frustration from those who feel on the verge of losing their housing. But two, it is also a convenient dodge for well-to-do members of society to hide their selfishness behind some veneer of collectivism convincing people that the plight of the poor is also their plight. And I haven't even scratched the surface on what actually causes gentrification and what measures we can do to alleviate it. I've implied that housing is at least in part a supply problem. I could also point out various studies that show that new construction doesn't necessarily accelerate displacement or gentrification and might have the opposite effects of relieving upward pressure on rents. But that's a topic for later. One last question remains, of course, and that is, is Streeter Sweeper a shill for big real estate? For that answer, well, you'll have to tune in next time. No! Oh, God, no. What the f***? Why would you ask me that? The real estate industry can go to hell. I mean, I, I hate them. I mean, as much as I hate the pharmaceutical industry, they're both gougers, but... I don't know, I'm not going to refuse to take the vaccine if I really need it. I mean, these things need to be regulated, of course, and, you know, the impact has to be lessened on vulnerable people in society. I mean, the economic data in favor of supplying denser housing mimics that same effect. It doesn't mean I'm opposed to corporations profiting, not to alleviate a huge crisis.